Delmarva Today with Don Rush. It's known as hyper-education, where students who are doing well get extra tutoring to get ahead in life. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Private tutoring, including learning centers, is expected to be around a $250 billion industry within the next three years. And it's reflected in the proliferation of such competitions as the Scripps National Spelling Bee. In particular, Asian American immigrants have seen this type of education as a key to the future. Pavan Ingra has written a new book which looks at this phenomenon. And it's called Hypereducation, Why Good Schools, Good Grades, and Good Behavior Are Not Enough. And we have him on the phone this morning. Welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for having me. So... Tell me, describe a little bit about this phenomenon. Is it a new phenomenon that we're seeing in terms of uh, these uh, this, uh, private tutoring, these centers, these learning centers? What's the history here? Yeah, great question, because it's not new, but it could be something that people haven't seen much before. That is to say that, is to say that this has been around, these tutoring companies and tutoring as a, you know, extracurricular activity has been around for decades. In fact, um, no Child Left Behind, which um, a federal legislation from the early 2000s gave you know billions of dollars to tutoring, and, and, and much of it, a lot of it went to these private companies. So they've been around for a while, but what's new is that they've grown considerably, and that families whose kids, you know, in many many respects, don't need tutoring, don't need any academic support, are the ones who are increasingly taking part in this. And in fact, these companies, their growth model oftentimes, is to grow in areas that are um, neighborhoods where the schools are, you know, well-resourced, well-ranked, and there's no real urgency, but that's where they're finding a lot of clientele. So what kind of people are taking advantage of this? All kinds of people. Um, you mentioned a minute ago that um, a number of Asian immigrants are doing it, and that's true, especially in areas where they're, you know, the highly concentrated. But, you know, they're, it's happening in, you know, uh, New Hampshire, as well as in Boston, as well as in D.C., as well as, you know, down the coast and anywhere across the country. So it's happening in our, mostly in our more larger metropolitan areas, but this is the trend that we're seeing across the country. You could be in St. Louis, right, and you'll see it there. It's not, and it's oftentimes from families who are, have enough kind of, you know, uh, income and financial means to pay for this extra tutor because it's not cheap. So a couple hundred bucks a month you're paying for your child to do this on top of anything else they may be doing after school. So you have to have some disposable income. Um, and, but it is not limited to any one racial group or any one kind of demographic per se. So you mentioned a lot, by the way, about these competitions. We mentioned the mm -hmm. spelling bee, there's math counts. Describe for me that, because you actually open up the, the book itself uh, with the spelling bee. Yeah, so another, alongside these academic um, tutoring companies, Another major venue that parents are turning to to give their kids an educational boost is through academic competitions. The Scripps National Spelling Bee is the most popular one, but there's dozens, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of these. Geography, history, you name it. Uh, math, obviously, science. And so some communities have taken this so seriously that they've developed their own academic competitions just for themselves. So that we all know about the Scripps National Spelling Bee, but there's even spelling bees just for Indian immigrants and their kids, because you know, your listeners may know this, Indian immigrants have been dominating the bee for many, many years until this year. Um, and it's become like a, a major interest in the community. So they, had, they developed their own spelling bees. And I went to some of those as well, as well in addition to kind of national level competitions um, in DC, for instance. Um, so it's, and it become, and so the students who take part in these competitions Sometimes they get dragged into them by their parents, but I want to make sure listeners know that this isn't some kind of story about, you know, mean authoritarian tiger parents who just push their kids so, you know, too much. I was, I was curious about that and was wondering, is that really the case? And that does happen, and I talk about that. But I also explain how some kids really gravitate towards these things and really enjoy being part of these spaces. They actually kind of resent stereotypes of them as being single-minded and not, you know, and being dominated by their parents. So it's a really kind of more complicated and, and nuanced portrayal that we're trying to give here. 
You mentioned, by the way, specifically the immigrant population, obviously the Indian American population that you focus on often. But you indicate that this is a way for immigrants to move up the ladder in terms of uh, both mm -hmm. income and socially, that they don't have the kind of, uh, say, networks that people who have been born here, um, particularly white folks uh, who have been born here, have. Describe that. It, it almost yeah. seems as if there's a, a, a sense of um, uh, that they, they're, they're behind it a bit, that they, don't, they need to catch up some, some fashion or find a way to get into the social right. system. And glad you used the word social system because that's exactly right. Many of these immigrant families have, you know, well-paying jobs and, you know, have um, a high educational background. So they're, they're not like, you know, worried in some kind of really dire way. But they still don't think that they're really well integrated and their kids won't have the same advantages as their neighbor's kids because they're new to the country. Like, you know, if, if, it's, if an immigrant wants to help their child get ahead, they can't turn to their like sorority or fraternity, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, or their uncle who, you know, who lives nearby or, you know, another state to get, you know, an internship or get guidance or anything because they don't have any of those networks. And so a lot of these parents think, well, we have to give our kids extra advantages elsewhere to compensate for what they're not going to have because we are new to this country. We don't have the same kind of support systems. And they turn to academics because, these parents themselves have gotten ahead through academics and, you know, and done well. So like a lot of parents, right. You know, if you've done, if you've gotten, if you, if you succeeded and felt like a certain kind of approach when you were younger helped you grow and become who you are, it's natural to try to do the same thing for your kids. And we see that on the sports fields too. A lot of parents who succeeded in sports, put their kids in, the, not just in sports in general, but in the same sport in which they excelled. It's like, it's just what parents, how parents oftentimes think about what it means to give their kids the best opportunities. So we're seeing this academically. And the issue here, right, is that when we see it academically, not just on the sports fields, there's a lot of implications for the kids in schools who aren't getting tutored or aren't in competitions. I talked to a lot of teachers, mental health experts, guidance counselors, college admissions officers, and they have a lot of concerns around the kids who are getting hyper-educated, even though the parents believe this is the best thing to do for their kids for in the long term. What are those concerns? So teachers see kids, and I'm talking about young kids, let's say eighth grade, fifth grade, kindergarten even, who are being hyper-educated and over-scheduled in, in the teacher's minds and end up be, you know, be having breakdowns in school. So, for instance, a third grade teacher said that she sees kids who are so stressed they become nonverbal. A kindergarten teacher says that she has kids who are prone to crying because they're doing more and more now at, at such a young age. And the teachers say the extra academic push by parents is a key reason why. I talked to a mental health guidance counselor of sorts, and she was sitting with some elementary students. And she asked them, you know, what, what worries you? What concerns you? And these very young elementary students said their responses were the SAT and getting into college. Right? And it was shocking to her. But this is what their kids are hearing from their parents. And inadvertently, parents are not trying to stress out their kids, obviously. But when parents put pressure or put even this emphasis on extra academics, it conveys the message to the kids that this matters so much that they get more stressed out. And I talk to teachers who worry that not only will the kids be stressed, but ironically, tutored kids can end up learning less in school than non-tutored kids. And I talk about that as well. And, and, and I'm really trying to give the book, is really trying to help parents understand what's at stake in this growing trend so they can make better choices for themselves. Let me ask you this, because uh, you mentioned uh, in the book that, uh, for instance, non-immigrant folks, um, they don't place as much emphasis on academics necessarily, that they, there's a lot of emphasis on sports, that kind of thing, as opposed to immigrants who often will emphasize the academic side. Um, I'm curious about what happens when you get second and third generation down the way, whether or not this kind of emphasis on academia uh, continues on or whether they become... Uh, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word, assimilated. Yeah, that's a great question. And you do see a lot of assimilation, right? And so that it is a, 
um, you will see less emphasis on it over time. That to answer your question, but I want to as, add one thing, which I interviewed a lot of you know, you know, U.S. born and raised white families who do this, and some of them will say that they look at immigrants around them doing it, and they feel they must do it also just to keep up. But others also say that you know they um, they really want to they really value this kind of academic emphasis, and not just the academic growth, but also the sense that their kids are kind of being, understanding the importance of hard work in an educational way. And they really appreciate having their kids in these venues, whether it be tutoring centers or competitions, because it gives these kid, their kids uh, kind of an extra kind of, you know, emphasis on what's, what's important to them as a family, right? It's so a lot of white families um, who, without any kind of immigrant background, convey a lot of, put a lot of emphasis on this as well, even though, as it, you know, sports is still the activity that, parents and Americans in general, we spend the most money on after school. Now, you mentioned the idea that these tutoring grounds, these tutoring programs, that they can be effective in the short term, but that there might yeah. be some long-term impact. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So uh, if parents are considering this for their kids, which can make sense. They really need to think about and then better and ask questions around what is the tutoring company's pedagogical strategy to make sure that it's really setting up your kids, not just for some short-term gains, but for some, but for long-term, you know, appreciation of learning. Some tutoring companies will give prizes to kids who complete their homework really well or complete it on, turn it in on time. And like, you know, it doesn't take a psychologist to tell you that pretty soon the students are doing the homeworks in order to get the prize. And after the prize, but if they thought if they start, so they, they start finding the prize to be kind of boring or not very exciting, then they don't care as much about the homework. And so the tutoring company has to kind of up the prizes to make them more and more expensive or interesting just to keep the students engaged in the homework. So now the, the tutoring company has inadvertently, right, lessened and weakened students' interest in the homework by making it uh, connected to a prize. So in the, in the short term, parents see their kids doing the homework quickly, you know, maybe even getting excited by it, and they think this is working great. And they see that their students, their kids, like grades, are you know stay strong or go up. The errors they get on their math homework, for instance, go down. And they have a lot of you know pride and a sense of accomplishment in putting their kids in the, in the tutoring center. But over time, that wears off, and it can actually have a different, the opposite of, of the effect than we want where kids no longer see learning and education as a worthwhile goal. It becomes, well, what's in it for me? Why am I doing this, right? And that's something we really want to avoid. Um, we want to create lifelong learners. And sometimes putting too much emphasis on education and not framing it the right way at a young age can have the opposite effect. I was interested in something you said in an interview you did because you talked about this idea that they may not always learn the fundamental concepts, that there is this emphasis on yeah. rote learning. Tell me a little bit about that because once one of the ways that people learn is through concepts and putting things together um, and also ultimately lead to creative thinking and problem solving. Tell me a little bit about what you found. So I spoke to a math teacher, a middle school math teacher, and he said that he sees students, he can tell what students have, are being tutored, tutored on the side, um, and they come in and they can, you know, they can do the homework pretty fast, and they also act as if they know it all because they've, they've been exposed to this topic, let's say a couple of months before it, it happens in the classroom. So once they're in the classroom, the students are no longer that engaged because they feel like it's boring. I already know this, and they will then therefore um, take in less of the teachers lessons than other students who have not been tutored well. And that's a real problem because in our, in our schools, they're really focusing on helping students understand the foundations of what's go of math, let's say, how it works, why it works this way. Whereas tutoring, co tutoring companies can be more focused on making sure students just know how to do the questions, how to do the formulas, how to solve, how to find the answers. And unless you have both of those, in particular you have the former, you have a sense of why things work the way they do, the way our school system teaches it, you're not going to be able to have the strong foundation to then carry you into higher level math. And so teachers are actually worried that tutored kids may end up not getting the same foundation and the same grounding and ability to move up and, and then problem solve and do creative thinking 
because of how they're approaching the classroom given their tutoring. It's a real concern. Again, that's not apparent in the short term. You're not going to notice that um, in the first few months or even six months or so their child is being tutored. It's a long-term impact. In terms of the public schools, what does this say about the public schools? And is this mm -hmm. an assault, for instance, on public schools, or a sharp critique of the public schools? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because in many ways it is, right? I mean, parents are not turning to, they're not paying out of the pocket and, you know, driving their kids around town on weeknights because they think their kids are getting the greatest education possible in their public school. And most of the kids I spoke to are in public schools, right? They're doing so because they think their, their kids can be learning more than what they are and they're not being challenged enough or they're at grade level, but they just want to make it, but they don't think the teacher is, you know, able to give their kid enough attention because there's so many kids in the classroom. We all, we hear these critiques of our public schools all the time that, but it's most of the critiques we hear of our public schools is that, you know, their kids are falling behind, our, you know, our test scores internationally are not good enough, we're underfunded, but this is critiques of our public schools that are actually doing pretty well. And even here, parents are saying the schools are not doing enough. So it, it, it's a real issue um, of what this means for our public schools, both for the kids themselves, as I've already talked about, but also is our school system really giving kids the kind of learning that they deserve at all levels, right? When you're below grade level, when you're at grade level, and when you're above grade level, are each of those kinds of students getting differential instruction from our teachers? And a lot of parents will say no. A lot of parents are saying, to school, they told me, our schools are really good if you're kind of in the middle or you're like, or you need help. A lot of the emphasis is on support for those, you know, who are behind in reading or it's, you know, extra math tutoring. But for, if your child is, you know, in the top 40%, not even the top 5% or 10%, they are not getting any kind of additional kind of emphasis or attention. A lot of parents feel this way and they turn to extra academics on the side as a way to supplement that, right? So there is a concern around how well our schools are able to meet the, the needs of students who are, you know, at or slightly above grade level. What does this do then in terms of socialization? I mean, I know we have tracking, for instance, so that, uh, for instance, people who, students who do well may be uh, funneled into one particular uh, class uh, as opposed to others which need remedial, but that, that there isn't this mix and that it's somehow the socialization gets divided up. I mean, so that you're not well-rounded. If you're only around people who are like you, then mm -hmm. you don't appreciate those who are, who are not like you who may be in another different class. Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, um, I'm less worried about that than I might otherwise be mm -hmm. because the students who are in these, you know, tutoring centers on the side or even those who will spend hours a day uh, studying for a math competition or something like that or, or a spelling or geography competition, they're, they still have multidimensional lives. They're still like on the you know, soccer field playing soccer with kids. They're in dance classes with other kids. They're, they're getting around. And one of the thoughts, that, actually one of the concerns I had when I started writing the book was, are these parents, are these kids kind of really locked down in really kind of one dimensional upbringing? And they're not, I mean, it's, it's one of the assumptions I had and they're not. And so getting back to the socialization part, yeah, they may be in classes with people just like themselves, but, um, and, that, and there's a growing educational divide. That's, that's a real issue. But in terms of the kids, you know, personal socialization, they find themselves in a wide array of spaces so that they're not being just um, alongside people like themselves, whatever that might look like. Because what are the emphasis upon education in this country from its founding was this idea that, um, that education was an attempt to not only obviously give people perhaps skills in terms of their economic side of it, but also the social and political skills to be good mm -hmm. citizens. Uh, do you see that reflected at all in uh, the hyper-education? That is really not an emphasis on the hyper-education. Hyper-education is about skill building. Make me a faster reader, better at my equations, more fluent in a language, uh, more knowledgeable around about you know facts and figures. And it's really less about kind of the civics of it, the community building of it. And so, you know, right now we're in a pandemic and we all know that wearing a mask is, is incredibly important. 
Uh, and, you know, I wear a mask less to protect myself, but to protect you. And you wear a mask to protect your neighbor. In other words, you have to be somewhat civic minded in order to really buy into wearing a mask and why it's important. And if we have a, if we're thinking of education as really just about giving our kids the skills, 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 and drills, 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 then we're not teaching them something really significant, which is around the need for greater um, commitment to the social good and how that, um, uh, how that will be a important kind of part of their upbringing. I mean, do you think that there is a too much emphasis in general on this idea that you need to get all these skills in order to get a good job, that sort of thing, as opposed to, for instance, appreciating appreciating the world around you? I mean, is, that's what because that's when one of the things that college does is that it has this lower um, set of classes that will allow you to go ahead and uh, learn about the world beyond just simply your own personal profession. Yeah, I think that would be ideal, that we would be able to find spaces where kids are being pushed in ways beyond their comfort zones so they can really appreciate um, what a full education means. And that may be too much to ask, right, at a young age. And the, on a, and the concern, and parents spoke about this, right? They, they, parents who, who do this are mindful that they could be um, creating kids who have a really narrow set of interests. And one parent confided in me and said, are we really, are we losing our artists? Are we losing our creative thinkers because we're kind of drilling kids in this kind of way? And even though she had her kids in extra, in hyper education, she still have, she, you know, she was reflecting on this. And this was a, um, a, a meaningful uh, worry, but parents still felt that they had um, little recourse but to do this because of all the reasons we've already talked about, which is that they, don't think that unless they, they, they don't, unless they do this, the kids will be behind, or unless they do this, uh, their kids will have advantages relative to other kids who have better networks, or their kids won't be challenged enough. So a lot of reasons to do this, even as parents were mindful that it could be limiting in what kind of breadth uh, and, and person they were allowing their children to become. One of the interviews you uh, did, uh, you talked about hyper-education as being, quote, another nail in the coffin of childhood, at least as we know it. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so there's so much concern what about what it means to be a child today, and do kids even have a childhood? That is to say, do they have enough free time, play time, unorganized time, unstructured time? And you, know, you can talk about this for hours, and there's so many books written about this. Uh, and the issue is that we already know about kids' sports and music lessons and everything else, all the things that are in some ways complements to the school, because the school is not going to give a child violin lessons, you know, in, in fourth grade. A school doesn't even teach you how to play softball or baseball until middle school. So you need to have these extracurricular activities at a young age in order to, for kids to learn and be exposed to different things. But what I'm talking about here is different. Here families are looking at educational extracurriculars, which is exactly what they're already getting in school. They're already getting educations in school, and sometimes they're getting really good ones. And parents are still saying, no, I want to organize my child's after school, I want to put them in another activity, I want them to have less free time so they can become more prepared for academic rigor at a later age. In other words, it becomes another as I said, nail in the coffin around what childhood could be. And it's and as some parents do this, they raise the level of what's expected academically in a school. And so other parents feel compelled to do it in order to keep up. There is an academic arms race that's going on, and it starts younger and younger these days. Are they simply being overscheduled? I mean, that there's not enough playtime, as it were? That's a real, yes, that is true. They're, the people, kids today are increasingly overscheduled. Uh, it's not all kids, but middle class kids and upper middle class kids um, and increasingly working class kids are being overscheduled. And it's a real concern. And, you, and we talk about, and, it, and it's leading to burnout, it's leading to a lack of to sleep, um, extra stress. Um, and when parents do this, they oftentimes are thinking, oh, I need to do this because I could really enjoy this thing, or if I just really supplement what they're getting elsewhere, and they really need to do this to so get exposed to something different. 
parents have a lot of good reasons why they're paying all this money and driving around everywhere uh, for their kids. But the, the overall outcome, kind of the gross outcome of this, is one that is taking away from all of what kids need most, which is downtime, flexibility time, um, proper sleep, eating together as a family as opposed to eating in the car as you're driving from, you know, soccer practice to to the tutoring company. Right? This is how a lot of kids are growing up. I have college students that I teach, and I ask them, you know, how many of you had dinner in the car as you went from one place to another? And a lot of them raised their hands, and, th- and this is growing like even more since um, those kids, those students, were young. Do you think that, by the way, all this tutoring is creating a educational divide? Yes, there is. So tutoring can be really helpful for students who are um, struggling to keep up with gra- struggling to keep up with grade level, or are in schools that are underfunded and under resourced, right? So that can be really helpful to help kids get up to grade level. And tutoring, is, you know, as it's meant to be, is to hopefully reduce educational inequality and educational gaps. However, the way in which many families increasingly are using after-school academics, it is going to widen the educational gap because they're already in spaces where they have good resources. Their kids are already at grade level, sometimes above grade level, and increasingly turning to after-school academics. And that's the goal, in in fact, the goal is to stay above the rest. The goal is to get their kids into an honors class, an AP class, uh, you know, an elite college uh, at some point, or internship, or whatever it might be, right? So that it's not just an outcome or a byproduct. Oftentimes, it's the intent, right? And I don't blame parents for this because they're trying to do what's best for their kids. But this is still the the social impact of what's going on. But the kids themselves, as they move into adulthood and they look back on their experience, uh, what do they say about it? A lot of kids, actually, um, and that, I'm glad you asked because uh, I had assumed that students would look back and be really regretful, and some are. Some say, I you know, really wish I could have gotten out of this thing. Um, but a lot of them say, you know, I may, may not have liked it at first, but those students who stick with it and it becomes something they, they personally found motivating, they really appreciate what they got out of it, right? Um, and those, those are typically the students who found some kind of academic competition that they found really worthwhile and worth the hours they put into it. Students who are just in the tutoring companies, um, they and, they, and that's their only kind of extracurricular education, they often, t- they may find parts of it enjoyable, but they don't speak of it in any kind of, you know, passionate way or such. And some students would be glad to leave if their parents let them. Looking ahead to education, what kind of impact in, do you see uh, on t- our general education um, from this uh, extra tutoring and this emphasis on academics, um, is there what 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 do you expect then will happen to public education? I worry for teachers because they're the ones who are on the front lines of having classrooms, especially after a year of remote learning, where student preparedness, student abilities really vary in a wide wide range. Then if you on top of that, you have children who are hyper-educated on the side, it just adds to that breadth and the difficulty of a teacher having to speak to, you know, 20 students of such different levels of backgrounds, right? And that's one of the real concerns here. And as that happens, and if parents don't think their teachers, uh, you know, their elementary school or middle school teachers are uh, properly or effectively teaching their kids, then they have parents get even more incentive to continue with hyper education. So it's just going to reproduce itself. And in fact, these tutoring companies are advertising themselves as able to address the kind of the impacts of COVID and remote learning on student learning. They advertise as um, helping deal with the quote unquote cookie cutter approach of public education. So they tutoring companies are, are focusing in on kind of the anxieties of parents. And these anxieties, I think, have, are only going to grow and impact teachers as well as the students. We've been speaking with Pavan Adingra. He has written a new book entitled Hyper Education, Why Good Schools, Good Grades, and Good Behavior Are Not Enough. And we do appreciate you taking the time this morning to talk with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. This has been Delmarva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening.
Delmarva Today with Don Rush.